Uh, the main purpose of this talk is to show how American officials sought to translate victory over Japan into a lasting peace in Asia. Um, I'm primarily concerned with the interaction between military planning, operations, and foreign policy. Um, I'll state my thesis early. Uh, the U.S. was unprepared for victory in the summer of 1945. There you have it. Uh, the demands of a two-front war had dictated American objectives. The achievement of a united China, friendly to the United States, and a liberated Korea fell into the category of aspirational goals that were likely to be beyond the reach of American military power. Franklin Roosevelt also supported a gradual end to European colonialism in Southeast Asia, but strategic necessity placed those areas out of the reach of US operations. On the other hand, control of Japan and the Western Pacific were deemed essential to American security. So American strategy concentrated on achieving those goals above all others. So I'll say American strategy was linear and sequential. Japan came first, everything else came later. It was a strategy that was informed by aware, an awareness of limits and restraint. And then the war abruptly ended months before the Americans expected it to. Suddenly, the Asian mainland was in reach of US military power. It's one of the ironies of the war, and certainly Chiang Kai-shek, China's leader, must have thought so, that American power on the Asian mainland crested in the months after the war had ended. The American position in post-war East Asia resulted from, a fundamental, from fundamental strategic choices made early in the war, and I'll talk about those in a minute, and then a series of ad hoc decisions and improvised responses to the chaos that followed in the wake of Japan's collapse. So the stage was set by its fundamental objectives, but then this sudden opportunity was created uh, by Japan's surrender, and the decisions the Americans took at that point would then kind of enmesh it uh, on the, uh, the United States on the Asian mainland. Um, those decisions did much to influence the course of events in Asia for decades to come. But despite the surge in American power, the US could not make those developments on the mainland conform to American interests. So there was no clean break with the past when Japan surrendered. Japan's rampage through Asia had shattered old empires and abetted the growth of revolutionary movements throughout the region. Total war had produced Japan's defeat, but at the time of Japan's surrender, more than 3 million undefeated Japanese troops remained at their posts in the field. As a force in being, the Japanese Imperial Army held its ground in a political no man's land, standing somewhere between the restoration of the pre-war order and the forces of revolution. Taking the surrender of Japanese troops was a military operation fraught with political implications. The decisions made to affect Japan's surrender entangled US forces on the mainland of Asia for the next two years, so between 45 and 47, and helped to shape the next several decades of international relations in Asia. So I wanna talk about the sort of fundamentals of American strategy first and begin with the tensions that existed within that strategy. Um, so America's strategy for victory um, was focused on Europe first. I mean, everybody's aware of that. And that meant resources went primarily um, towards defeating the Germans with the understanding that the Japanese would not be able to stand for very long once Germany was defeated. At the same time, the United States adopted the policy of unconditional surrender. Now, unconditional surrender was meant to be a prelude to the transformation of the defeated enemy. And unconditional surrender could only be achieved through the invasion of Japan's home islands. 
So, you know, there would have to be a large military operation in order to achieve um, the goal of unconditional surrender, which was just the first step towards securing peace in the Pacific. Now, as Americans developed this strategy, they were also American military leaders, Franklin Roosevelt, George Marshall, in particular, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they're very much aware of the likelihood of war weariness entering into the American uh, public, uh, thinking about the war, um, the longer it dragged on and the more the casualties mounted. So in order to fend off um, this uh, war weariness from developing as long as possible, Roosevelt and the Joint Chiefs made concessions to the home front. One was the what's known as the 90 division gamble, which was basically a decision to mobilize fewer divisions than originally expected. And, and the thought here was that that would allow the US to provide um, supplies to its allies, uh, the Russians, the Chinese, and the British primarily, right? But it would also re reduce the strain on the domestic economy and allow for the availability of more consumer goods, which it was hoped would then, um, uh, you know, sort of in a sense, buy off uh, American support for the war a little bit longer. Um, the problem is, of course, the reliance on 90 divisions meant that by the end of the war, the Americans were getting pretty thin uh, with their frontline troops. And that was particularly the case during the Battle of the Bulge. Um, okay, so another concession to the home front was a program of partial demobilization that was gonna begin when Germany surrendered. And this is the idea that GIs would have accumulated uh, points through their uh, length of service, how many dependents they had, um, military valor, if you won medals, time in a combat zone, you got bonus points and bonus points for being overseas, that sort of thing. And once you cross this threshold in points, you would be um, sent home after Germany surrendered. Um, now, I mean, that was, you know, a concession to the public um, and also to the GIs to let them know that, um, you know, they would not be expected to fight the duration of the war if they landed in North Africa, say, in 1942. All right. But this whole idea of Europe first, unconditional surrender, which required an invasion, and concessions to the home front on mobilization, they were all political choices that tipped the scales against the achievement of a timely victory uh, in the Pacific. And another big problem was uh, geography and, and logistics. And I sort of always like this, uh, um, picture, this map here. Um, you know, this one really is worth a thousand words. I think, and it gives you a pretty clear idea of the challenges that uh, the Americans were facing. Notice you can't even see Japan in this map, and, and nor can you see Hawaii. This is just the Southwest West Pacific, which gives you an idea of the demands that would be placed upon uh, the Americans as they moved uh, westward across the Pacific. Um, there's a sort of old cliche that amateurs talk strategy and professionals talk logistics. And, and I think this map sort of drives home the uh, logistical challenges that the Americans were facing in waging war against Japan. All right, um, despite that, by uh, in the beginning of 1944, uh, we could see a rising tempo of operations, uh, the addition of fast carriers uh, the implementation of leapfrogging along, for example, the um, uh, northern coast of New Guinea by uh, General MacArthur, and then also island hopping through the Central Pacific by Admiral Nimitz. Um, the capture of the Marianas were all, all had begun to take place, and this 
is a um, pretty handy chart showing you can see how the pace of operations increases in 1944 and continues uh, through 1945 as well. So you can get a sense of kind of increasing momentum uh, as the Americans moved across the Pacific. Now, at the same time, China was on the verge of collapse. Uh, the Japanese had launched an operation Ichigo in which they um, uh, really put Chiang Kai-shek's regime in peril um, after several years of a kind of stalemated uh, uh, conflict. It was, it was clear from this operation um, in this offensive the Japanese had the ability to move when they wanted to in China. Um, and they had been provoked by uh, long range bombing um, that uh, the US was conducting out of China and they attacked the bases. And, um, and in doing so, as I said, they imperiled Chiang Kai-shek's uh, regime. Um, this precipitated a crisis in China uh, between the Americans and the Chinese, and it led to the recall of General Joseph Stilwell, who was the uh, uh, chief of staff to Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, and, and so Chiang Kai-shek sort of won that round, but at the same time, China moved into strategic irrelevance um, as the Americans began to uh, run their bombing raids on Japan from uh, the Marianas, uh, and they pulled out of China. Uh, China remained politically important, but Americans were uh, determined not to commit one of the classic blunders in history, and we all know that that is that it's it's uh, no land war in Asia, right? And so the Americans were going to um, leave Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists to their own. Uh, devices for the for the time being. The Russians would have to defeat the Japanese. And that gets settled and worked out at Yalta in 1945. Now I want to stop here for a minute and just point out that you know the United States had been a great power in Asia before World War II by virtue of its possession of the Philippines and the treaty rights it held in China. Uh, but the U.S. didn't control, you know, territorial concessions in China. They didn't have huge investment in China. Um, intermittently, beginning with Theodore Roosevelt, uh, the Americans had appeased or deferred to Japan um, in uh, Northeast Asia and Manchuria and, and, and especially Korea. So, in effect, you know, it was what you know, Americans um, certainly were sympathetic to the Chinese when they were attacked by Japan. Uh, they remained so, although less so as the war dragged on. Um, supportive of China, you know, something you might call the open door constituency that consisted of um, missionaries, um, people like Henry Luce, the publisher of Time Magazine, who was a child of missionaries, um, bi some business leaders, not a lot of them, um, you know, saw a future in China, and they talked about China all the time in a sort of future tense. But, you know, in the midst of the war, the United States wasn't going to commit uh, you know, a lot of its resources um, to assisting China at that, that time. And so Russia was going to handle the Japanese army in Northeast Asia. Um, so beginning um, in 1945, we see the um, final campaigns as the United States was closing in on uh, Japan. They uh, land in the Philippines, take Iwo Jima in February, and the Battle of Okinawa begins um, in April, on April 1st, right? And all of this is in preparation for Operation Downfall, this two-stage 
um, invasion of Japan's home islands with the first one, you can see the sort of green arrows pointing toward the southernmost of the main islands, Kyushu. Um, and the second operation uh, was going to, um, Coronet was going to aim at the Tokyo Plain, and that would require uh, the, the addition of troops from Europe. Those troops who were not demobilized would be transported out to the Pacific um, and follow on in the invasion of the Tokyo Plain. Um, it was just at this moment, um, as the Americans were gearing up for the invasion of Japan, that Germany surrendered in May, and that triggered the demobilization that I uh, had mentioned earlier. And, and this is where the home front began to weigh in. Um, Americans sort of started looking, um, once Germany surrendered, started looking past Japan and, and towards peace. Um, and uh, they started demanding the rapid demobilization of troops, bring daddy home was the, the cry that went up. Uh, people sent uh, baby shoes to their congressmen, um, you know, telling them, try and get this demobilization to move more quickly. Um, the whole process of demobilization was uh, complicated because it was going to take place simultaneously with redeployment, that redeployment from Europe that I talked about. And so what you had to do was um, sift out those soldiers who had the requisite number of points to be demobilized and returned home out of active divisions and then take what was left basically and shape those units up, give them training for combat in the Pacific, transport them across the Atlantic, across the continental United States and out to the Pacific. Um, the um, head of the services of supply likened this to moving the entire city of Philadelphia to the Philippines, um, which actually would probably sounds like a good idea to some people, but, but um, uh, General Marshall, who was not given to exaggeration, said this was the biggest administrative task in history, that what needed to be done. And you had, so you had this problem, you had to um, figure out how many points everybody had and, and as it turns out, a lot of the people who had the highest points were the company clerks, and they were the ones who kept the records, right? And so if they left, then you had to, you know, you were left trying to figure out who else uh, qualified. On top of that, points were always being adjusted because the Army was awarding campaign ribbons um, on the fly. And so some divisions that were getting ready to move back across the Atlantic, suddenly would lose as much as 2,000 infantrymen who, who now had the requisite points and had to be pulled out. And then somehow replacements were going to have to be found for them. So this was an incredibly complex situation, which was taking place in the midst of the demobilization of these soldiers and trying to get them back. Um, I've got the... Um, uh, declassified uh, plan uh, for that right here. As you can see, this is an intensely complex uh, operation here, a Rube Goldberg-like operation somebody uh, might actually be thinking. On top of this, there was a growing demand from the business community, from labor, uh, from the president, the new president, Harry Truman, his economic advisors were all demanding that the United States had to pay more attention to the idea of economic reconversion. They had to begin shifting to a peacetime economy. If they waited too long, 
uh, until the war ended, they would be hit with a massive depression. People wouldn't be able to find jobs. Com uh, factories wouldn't be able to retool to peacetime uh, production fast enough. And so the idea was that they, the argument was they needed to do this more gradually. And that meant, you know, letting some soldiers out early, uh, coal miners, for example, railroad workers, uh, which the army refused to do. And it also meant a loosening of these restrictions on the production of consumer goods. Uh, again, the army was insistent that uh, their needs came first. And it was primarily the army that was placing these demands on the home front economy. All right. So these all these factors were converging and creating a sort of sense of uh, strategic perplexity, right? I mean, how is the United States going to keep everything together for the invasion of Japan that is um, going to be coming soon? Um, add into this then, I mean, some people said, well, you know, here's the shortcut. Um, here's how we deal with this issue. Why don't we modify unconditional surrender? And in particular, the, the, the key argument was let the Japanese keep the emperor, right? Um, so they called it clarification of unconditional surrender, but it was really a modification. It was a compromise that was being argued. This way, we can get the war over with sooner. Wouldn't have to invade the home islands. Well. That might pay other dividends as well. There was a growing chorus within the administration and in Congress saying, you know, if we get the war over with um, soon enough, we can get it done uh, without the help of the Russians. And the Russians won't get a foothold in Northeast Asia. And that's this cartoon kind of captures that argument because defenders of unconditional surrender uh, you know, condemned what they saw as this kind of appeasement uh, on the uh, on the part of you can call them sort of proto cold warriors, and you can see this sign. You know, this is this sort of countryfied congressman labeled our Russophobes, and Russia can't be trusted. We'll have to fight them sooner or later. Write your congressman, and then the Japanese propagandist is carrying his placard, impossible for Russian allies to stick together. Eventual bust up will make for opportunity for illustrious sons of heaven to negotiate a soft peace. So this cartoon and um, obviously is critical of the those people who wanted to modify unconditional surrender. And they, they have the character saying, it's remarkable coincidence we're both working the same side of the street. And so they were accusing the um, people they refer to, some of them privately as emperor worshipers, of really almost conniving with the Japanese, um, you know, forming a sort of secret alliance against the Russians. Uh, the the debate that took place at this time got pretty bitter. Um, so all this was taking place um, on the eve of the last. Um, summit conference that would be in Potsdam, right? Um, and on the eve of that conference, uh, sizing up the strategic situation, the Army's top planning group um, reminded General Marshall that, quote, the US as a matter of public will positively supports the integrity of China as a nation. They went on to say, however, whether the future will bring a different definition of what constitutes China proper cannot be said with certainty. So they were acknowledging as they planned for the invasion of Japan that China might turn out to be a lost cause for the Americans. Chiang Kai-shek might go under, they couldn't confront the Russians on the mainland. But the army was saying, as long as we control Japan and the offshore islands will succeed in our main goal, which is to keep the rest of the world out of the Pacific. So that was the idea. All right, so the operational boundaries 
that were agreed to at Potsdam between the British and the Russians and the Americans uh, reaffirmed this single-minded emphasis on the invasion of Japan. To prepare for the Soviet Union's entry into the war, the American Joint Chiefs and the Soviets established an operational boundary to prevent clashes between the converging forces. Right? And this line ran through the Kuril Islands and it bisected Korea at the 41st parallel. The area south of that line fell into the American zone of operations, but that boundary was just for air and sea operations only. The Americans were not expected to bring troops ashore on the Asian mainland or the Korean Peninsula. All right. In order to fair, further pare down American responsibilities in Asia, the Americans and the British agreed to expand the boundaries of the Southeast Asia Command. Americans referred to this <clears throat> Southeast Asia Command. Its acronym was SEAC. They said it really stood for Save England's Asian Colonies. Um, <clears throat> and they included Indochina below the 16th parallel, all of Thailand, Java, the Celebes, and Borneo. Um, the British also wanted to add Indochina north of the 16th parallel, but the Americans said that had to stay in the China theater because at some point, the Chinese were gonna mount an offensive and they would need to control that sort of right flank of their offensive. And so that they said they might, you know, at a later date, change the, uh, uh, eliminate that division of Indochina for operational purposes. But for the time being, it would stay in place. And that turns out to be pretty crucial for the history of Vietnam. All right. so. The Potsdam Declaration issued at the conference settled the debate over the emperor. There was nothing, no promises to the emperor at that point. But American strategy was thrown into disarray by the Japanese reinforcement of Kyushu by these problems of uh, redeployment that I mentioned and the insistence by Truman's closest advisors that the army's invasion plans were risking economic disaster at home. At the 11th hour, the Navy joined in by calling for a re-examination of the plans for downfall, which had, it had only tentatively approved back earlier in the summer. All right, so the US, uh, the use of the atomic bomb in August cut short then a growing debate over the war's purpose, unconditional surrender or something less. And it produced a swift decision where none had seemed likely it also obscured the extent to which American strategy had been unhinged by Japanese resistance and the fissuring of unity at home, which is something I think on the 75th anniversary of the end of the war we need to remember. So what followed then was on the night of August 10th and 11th, members of what was called the State War Navy Coordinating Committee uh, and the Joint Staff Planners began to draft documents that would spell out the steps to be taken by Japan in order to complete the surrender. And key among them was what was known as General Order Number One. By the morning of August 11th, the territorial provisions of the General Order were completed. And so, according to the draft, all Japanese troops in China, not counting Manchuria, Formosa, and Indochina, north of the 16th parallel, were to surrender to the representatives of Chiang Kai-shek. The Russians would take the surrender of Japanese forces in Manchuria, Korea, north of the 38th parallel, and Southern Sakhalin, and British forces would then get Southeast Asia. Um, and the Americans would divide up the Pacific, MacArthur taking Japan, Nimitz taking the Central Pacific Islands. Um, okay. This is what's known as general order number one. And you can see the, the division here at a clip uh, Korea at the 38th parallel. That decision was made um, by a couple of colonels looking at a wall map, uh, and actually a National Geographic map of Korea. 
uh, one of those colonels was Dean Rusk, who would subsequently be John Kennedy's uh, Secretary of State. Um, and you can see then the idea is to sort of divide up the surrender areas. Um, and, and the staff officers were able to do this pretty quickly because they simply took those operational boundaries that had been devised at Potsdam and then turned them into general order number one. Uh, the one exception was Korea. The State Department wanted American forces to occupy a portion of Korea to ensure that the United States would play a role in determining the political future of that former Japanese colony. Um, that wouldn't have been possible had Japan continued the war. But now all of a sudden, the idea of moving into Korea um, seemed like a possibility. Um, General Order Number One was written as if all an the anticipated Allied operations were proceeding as planned. But that wasn't the case. The Chinese were still tucked way back in sort of southwestern China. Um, Lord Mountbatten's forces were nowhere near Malaya, um, Singapore, uh, or Indonesia at that point. Um, Nevertheless, Japanese troops in those areas had would be ordered to surrender to the designated Allied commanders. That is, whenever they showed up. In the meantime, the Japanese were expected to retain control of the areas occupied, and that's crucial. On a geopolitical level, the, geo, uh, the general order favored the interests of the great powers at the expense of the insurgent anti-colonial forces in China, meaning the communists, but also Korea, Indochina, and Indonesia. General order number one provided the means through which the United States, Britain, and China sought to employ Japanese military forces for allied purposes now. Um, It soon became apparent in China, for example, that it would take weeks for the nationalist Chinese to move into the key coastal areas held by the Japanese. In the meantime, the communists said they were gonna ignore general order number one and take the surrender wherever they could. Ultimately, to forestall the communist efforts, the US dispatched uh, Marines into Northern China, somewhere between 40 and ultimately 60,000 of them. But they also re relied on the Japanese troops to hold their ground um, until the nationalists took over. And, and some of you may be familiar with uh, this memoir of uh, E.P. Um, uh, Sledge about the Pacific War. In fact, it became, I think, for that televised series one of the basic uh, sources. Um, Sledge's memoir actually continued beyond the surrender of Japan and talked about his experience in North China when he entered with the Marines. He referred to him and his uh, fellow Marines as fugitives from the law of averages. You know, they had they had survived combat in the Pacific, and now all of a sudden they were being thrust into the midst of a civil war between the Chinese communists and nationalists. And they didn't particularly like it, um, as it turns out. Um, here they are arriving um, in uh, Tianjin, and, and as Sledge points out, and, and that uh, they finally published that portion of the memoir separately. Uh, it was published posthumously uh, as uh, I think a China Marine or China memoir, I can't remember the exact title. Um, Sledge notes that as the Marines entered uh, Tianjin, there was a sign up that said, welcome US Army. They didn't really care for that. Um, okay, so there were other complications with the general order, particularly in Indochina, the French mistrusted Chinese intentions and they had objected immediately. But, but uh, the Americans decided to let the Chinese occupy Northern Indochina. Um, and French concerns were borne out when the Chinese nationalist troops occupied the colony north of the 16th parallel 
the Chinese enriched themselves at French expense. And more significantly, they allowed the Viet Minh, that is the communist led Vietnamese resistance movement to declare independence from France through the Democratic uh, Republic of Vietnam. And so they actually um, gave Ho Chi Minh kind of a head start in this period. Um, so um, general order number one was written in haste and revised through a process of ad hoc negotiation between the allies. In, in the process of trying to arrange an orderly surrender that comported with the great powers interests, the United States became more deeply involved in China's civil strife. And, and I'll show you, they were there ostensibly to oversee the repatriation of the Japanese, but they admitted, um, Dean Acheson, for example, who was under Secretary of State said, well, you know, the, all we had to do is, is to, you know, have point the Japanese in direction of the ships and they would have marched right onto them. It's not as if they needed the Marines there for that. Um, um, so the United States became enmeshed in China's civil strife and you can see they were shipping nationalists north then. And again, they were supposed to be there to relieve the Marines and uh, assume control of the uh, Japanese, but instead they began to march north into Manchuria to try and, and, and hold that area. Um, the US had also partitioned the Korean Peninsula and unexpectedly aided the revolutionary movement in Indochina. The general order's impact uh, is still felt today in the division of the Korean Peninsula. The ongoing dispute between Japan and Russia over the occupation of the Southern Korea Islands, what Tokyo calls the Northern Territories. So the sudden collapse of Japanese resistance in August 5, uh, 45 created an unexpected opportunity to influence events on the mainland and possibly check Soviet power in the region. And seeking to shape events on the mainland, the administration of Harry Truman confronted the anomalous nature of American power it amassed invasion forces, it's, excuse me, it's amassed invasion forces, armadas and planes and ships. And of course, it's nuclear monopoly gave the United States the appearance of irresistible might. But the American public, which had brought that juggernaut into being and the soldiers, sailors and Marines who wielded it against the enemy had a voice in how it would be used. In the final months of the conflict, we saw Americans had begun debating the purposes of the war and the price they were prepared to pay to achieve those ends. The abrupt end of the conflict provided only a brief interlude in that debate. In the aftermath of Japan's defeat, public debate over American aims in Asia resumed in an atmosphere of growing dissatisfaction with the disposition of American forces overseas. And this leads to what become known as the GI mutinies in late 1945. Eventually protest replaced debate as Americans voiced their contending views on the meaning of victory and the obligations of world leadership. And here's the protest in actually 46 in Manila. Um, I keep looking for my former mentor in here. He was in this group um, and it says, we shall never forget what you have done, words are cheap, get us home. Um, seismic forces were at work in Asia at the end of the war. The civil conflict that roiled Asia was the consequence of vast inequalities and social dislocation rooted in hundreds of years of exploitation by imperialist and ind indigenous elites. Japan's bid to dominate Asia was the latest chapter in that saga. In banishing the older imperialists, however, Japan had shattered the myth of white supremacy and nourished nationalist aspirations throughout the region. Japan's defeat reopened the question of who would rule Asia. The surrender touched off a frenzy of expectation and opportunistic maneuvering by the great powers seeking to reclaim lost empires or create new ones. The end of the war also created new opportunities for those revolutionary nationalists. 
between 45 and 47, American military and political officials struggled to build a stable Japan, a non-communist China, and a newly independent Korea free from independent turmoil and great power manipulation. Americans also hoped that the example of Philippine independence would serve as a model for the creation of an independent non-communist Vietnam. Instead, French obduracy led to Viet Minh insurgency. The Philippine government's uh, protection of entrenched interests provoked a rebellion among the peasants of central Luzon. And in South Korea, an authoritarian government took power and held on to it by brutally suppressing its opposition. Japan, in contrast, seemed a haven of tranquility in the midst of all this turmoil. And looming over all was the problem of China. By 47, the US was moving towards a return to the strategic priorities it had adopted at the beginning of the war. The Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan aimed to secure Europe. Japan once again became the chief priority in the Pacific. The beginnings of a reverse course in the occupation signaled that security there took precedence over reform. Meanwhile, after the failure of General Marshall's mediation effort in China, the US began to disengage from the mainland. And there you see the, China, the Marines headed home. South Korea was handed off to the UN. Still, the American presence lingered on the mainland, military advisory groups in China and South Korea and a small Marine contingent in Qingdao revealed an ambivalent attitude towards the Truman administration's new offshore policy. The administration's support for South, the South Korean government, its continued uh, congressional endorsement of Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist regime further frustrated any attempts to make a clean break from the mainland. For the moment, the situation seemed manageable. More critical problems elsewhere in Europe and the Middle East claim the administration's attention and its resources. So we're kind of back to where we started. Few Americans could imagine that within three years, the United States would become France's chief source of aid in a war against the Viet Minh or the United States would be thrust once more into the middle of the Chinese Civil War while American troops battle a dead, to a deadly stalemate on the Korean Peninsula. Okay, that's, uh, that's it. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Well, thank you. Um, if anyone in the, uh, any attendees have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section and I can see them and I can ask Professor Gohio here. Um, in the meantime, I had a few questions, so I was wondering if you could answer. Yeah. Um, my first is, from an American perspective, historically, looking at how they viewed um, the South, primarily South Asian European colonies, how did that differ from how they viewed Japan's colonial holdings, like Korea? Um, that's a good question. I. Um... You know, the Americans had deferred to the Japanese in Korea for much of that, of the first half of the 20th century. Um, and in fact, in the summer of 1945, um, Herbert Hoover recommended to Truman that the Japanese be allowed to keep Korea even after they surrendered. Um, Roosevelt believed that um, the war had demonstrated that the co that these colonial empires were a thing of the past and, and really had, instead of contributing to kind of international stability, had become a source of conflict. And so it was his hope that he could at least begin, I mean, he was constantly on Churchill to for example, grant independence to India and the like. And you know, and exactly how do you force an ally to do that, of course, is you know, Roosevelt never figured out. But I, I think, you know, it I think Americans were probably to the extent that they thought about this, they were probably split. You know, those people who were 
um, generally sympathetic towards the Japanese uh, leaders who had governed in the 1920s or so. People like Ambassador Joseph Grew and some of the Japan specialists felt like Hoover, you know, the Koreans couldn't govern themselves. And Japan had done a good job in Korea. You know, they had led this civilizing mission. By the same token, a lot of the members of what was known as the old diplomatic corps in the foreign service, the people who served in uh, European posts, they had the same feeling about the British in Southeast Asia and the Dutch. You know, they, they dismissed the idea that these revolutionary movements were real. They, they uh, said it's really Japanese propaganda. Um, and and they, so they took the European point of view. But, you know, elsewhere in the foreign service, uh, people who were like part of what they referred to as the YMCA crowd, you know, these people who had had experience, uh, maybe in China, they had grown up as children of missionaries. I mean, there's a definite kind of social um, kind of class difference, cultural difference. And, uh, uh, you know, they might have gone to public universities rather than Ivy League schools. They were more sympathetic to these revolutionary movements. They saw them as real. I think for the most part, you know, what Americans, the public demonstrated, for example, at the end of the war was they, whatever happened to those places, they didn't want Americans involved, right? So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it does. It's a uh, very good answer. Um, I have another question here. Okay, let's get one. Um, generally, how would you say that the lasting perception of America in East Asia, how East Asians perceived Americans, how would you say that that was reflected by the eventual unconditional surrender by Japan and the kind of forceful way that the US went about getting that surrender? Um, you mean, how did other people in Asia see America's commitment to unconditional surrender or? How did other East Asian countries and other East Asian people feel lasting um, beyond the end of the war about oh. America, given that they had committed to force? Uh, I, I, I think attitudes were positive, except of course the, the the uh, U.S. lost some of that goodwill through use of the atomic bombs um, and the firebombing of Japan. I mean, sort of famously in the Tokyo war crimes trial, there are, I think, you know, for example, the uh, representative from India, um, you know, pointed out that that um, the um, the allies were colonial powers, too, and they had committed what could be considered atrocities in the war. And so there was, I think, a um, draining off of some of that goodwill. Um, I think the Chinese and Chinese leadership certainly welcomed US defeat of, of China, complete defeat of Japan rather. But Chiang Kai-shek remained bitter that he had not gotten more support from the United States during the war. Um, and he, he expected that when the war ended and I think was surprised and disappointed that it didn't, uh, it didn't arrive uh, when it did. So, and you know, there was a considerable, uh, um, I think, um, dismay in Korea at you know, the American decision, the idea was Roosevelt thought, well, we'll have a four power trusteeship. His main goal was to make sure that China and Russia didn't fight over Korea. So, I mean, the British, they didn't want to have anything to do with Korea. In fact, the Americans were surprised when the war ended that the British didn't plan to send troops there. Um, I mean, that came as a total surprise to army planners and, and, and they didn't. Um, 
until the Korean War, actually. Um, and and Koreans themselves, you know, they said, you know, this we're ready for independence. And there was a pretty significant grassroots resistance movement um, on the peninsula to Japanese colonialism. And the, the Americans kind of when they came in, they took the side of a lot of the people who had collaborated with the Japanese. Um, so um, I think they missed opportunities in there to uh, get more support uh, than they than they did. Actually, I mean, probably the, uh, the closest to unanimous support they got was in Japan, you know, through the occupation. Um, uh, thank you. Here, we have another question here. Um, did the Chinese nationalist government think that the U.S. should have helped them more to fight the CCP during the Chinese Civil War? Um, I don't know if, if I'm sure Chiang Kai-shek hoped that would be the case, but at the very least, he expected to get the, um, you know, supplies, the armaments he needed to wage uh, war against the communists. And one of the reasons why he was, uh, uh, so, you know, very enthusiastic about this plan to use China as a base to bomb Japan and, and the sea lanes around Japan is, of course, that the, um, he hoped that the Chinese would get an air force out of that which would assist him measurably against the communists. Um, so I, I think he was distressed that he didn't get more support. I, I don't think he, um, say, expected necessarily Americans to fight the communists. But, but the idea that, I mean, he was appalled when Americans suggested that he you know, negotiate a coalition government with the communists and that sort of thing. Uh, um, so yeah, that that added to his uh, you know bitterness. Thank you. Uh, we have another question here. Was there any relationship between the U.S. and Mao Zedong in the immediate post-war period and in the plan for preserving the peace? Kind of like what you're talking about. Well, the, the um, you know on and off. I mean, American diplomats in Chongqing met with Zhou Enlai, who was there during the war. And there was what was known as the Dixie Mission, um, what's called the American Observer Group that had been sent to the communist base camp, uh, Yunnan, in sort of Northwest China. And um, they, the people who were there had a very high opinion of the communists and what they had accomplished in the war. Um, and I, I think Mao hoped that they might exercise some influence on the American government, but um, a series of events in the summer of 45, I think convinced Mal that that wasn't gonna happen. And um, that the sort of, you know, reactionaries as he described them in the uh, Truman administration were gonna prevent uh, the Chinese communists from uh, achieving their goals uh, short of, you know, um, going without having to go to war. And um, the, um, you know, gen when General Marshall goes to negotiate, to mediate between his two sides, the communists recognize that the Americans have their thumb on the scale in favor of Chiang Kai-shek, that, that even if Chiang Kai-shek sort of violates all the agreements that are reached, the Americans wouldn't abandon him. And those were Marshall's instructions and he helped write them himself. And so, um, you know, I think Mal realized at that point um, that the, the best he could hope was that the Americans wouldn't intervene, although he, both he and Chiang Kai-shek expected at some point the Americans would intervene because they thought China was so important. See, that's the one thing they both agreed on uh, to the United States. Um, and in that sense, they were both surprised that it didn't happen uh, in the end. Um, so 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, if you would like to, you can take a moment to talk about your uh, book, Unconditional. Uh, oh, well, yeah, thanks. Um, the, well, I'll start with the, uh, a lot of this sort of discussion of this idea of the strategic limits and choices the Americans made and the um, um, problems of reconversion and demobilization. Um, I went into in uh, pre the previous book, I wrote that with my uh, former mentor, Waldo, Waldo Heinrichs. This is a, a book called uh, Implacable Foes. Um, and, and then the most recent one, Unconditional, I looked at the sort of partisan debates, the ideological dispute over unconditional surrender. And it, and it really was a, I think it kind of spilled out into American public life um, as a uh, political debate. Um, one, one of the virtues of that book is you can lift it with one hand um, as opposed to implacable foes, um, which is about 600 pages, but, but, um, um, but it's kind of tightly focused on this idea of the, um, the politics of uh, America's war aims, which I think had been neglected. I mean, we, um, you know, there's a sort of famous uh, uh, dictum by Clausewitz, you know, war is politics. I think it's through other means or the continuation of politics through other means. But, uh, you know, we think of that as kind of meaning seeking political objectives, but it, but it was actually a continuation of politics because unconditional surrender, I argue, was a, a New Deal program. I mean, what it, it sought to do was to create a New Deal for Japan, economic and political reform, rewriting the Constitution, all those things, um, um, you know, were indicative of a confidence in government's ability um, you know, to bring about positive change in a society. And, um, you know, with good reason, I mean, not without good reason, certainly, uh, conservatives who were mainly Republicans at that time were highly skeptical that the United States could successfully accomplish what it was setting out to do. Um, so I, I talk about that, and I talk about the way in which that the debate over unconditional surrender lingered and um, got caught up in the whole who lost China thing. And, and I, I was sort of interested in the way that debate gets transformed over, you know, the kind of history, you know, lives on uh, really even to this day. So that's what, that's what that book is about. And it, it'll make a great gift to bring home to your parents at Thanksgiving. Um, so. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And thank you everyone in the audience for coming in on a Wednesday night. Um, yeah. That about wraps it up for tonight. Thank you again. Okay. Oh, you're very welcome. And thank you for the invitation. I, I enjoyed it.